Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this uh, time of worship today, Lord. Lord, be with everyone here, Lord. They're continuing to heal, Lord. Lord, be with those that, uh, like Barry, that are out, Lord, still struggling, Lord. Just continue to give him strength and build him back up, Lord, to get him back here in your house. Your son's precious holy name. Amen. 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 Tonight, the title of today's message is uh, Praise You in the Storm. It kind of seems fitting lately since there seem to be a lot of storms going on. Um, especially for our poor folks in Louisiana. We need to keep, keep Pastor Jim and Tamley in our prayers. It seems like every time they get beat down, they get beat down again. And poor folks just can't get a break over there. So we need, need to continue to keep them in our prayers. Um, Jim and Tammy lost part of their roof in the first one. And I don't know what they got left after all the rest of these. But uh, God's still in control. So uh, today we're going to talk about raising him in the storm. And we're going to talk a little bit about Job today. Those of you that remember Job, Job had a rough time. No, not at all. Somebody in the Baptist chair somewhere. I mean, I promise not to call on you for something. <laughs> you know, it's, it's funny. I, w I was actually raised in a Baptist church, and we first started coming here. Uh, we got up here on tuning spokes, and we're singing, and all of a sudden, I just quit singing. And Monty says, are you okay, Dustin? I said, yeah, we're at the third verse. He said, what do you mean? I said, I was raised Baptist. I don't know the third verse to any hymn, <laughs> you know? We're going to do one, two, and four today, folks. One, two, and four. I, I feel bad for the guy that wrote the third verse. He never gets any credit for anything. <clears throat> but anyway, they got nothing new to sermon. <laughs> but uh, honestly, right now, many people in the world today are wondering exactly what's going on. Why God's allowing all this trouble. But the answer to these questions can't be found in politics or in protests but in preaching the gospel of Christ. The world's a wreck. Our nation's a mess. And right now we're all facing a big storm. And I just don't mean the election. I mean in general. You know, they're trying to take God out of everything. world persecutes Christians. But we're facing a storm. And basically what it comes down to is we got two, we got two choices in this right now. We can all run away and hide. Hope it passes us by. Or we can rise up and take back our lives and take back our world. Amen. This choice is ours. Right. See, we need to carry out the mandate to make disciples of all nations as Christ calls us to do. Because running away and hiding is not going to fix anything. However, no matter what the storms in life bring us, there's one thing that's clear. And that's God is still speaking to us. We're going to talk about Job a little bit. Hopefully everybody knows the story of Job. Job was a guy that had a lot of trouble. He ran into a lot of trouble. He was going through great difficulties. And even he had questions for God. Because of what he was going through. But some of his greatest questions were answered by God. It's written in Job 38, 1 through 7. And then the Lord spoke to Job out of the storm. Out of the storm. He said, Who is this that obscures my plans with words without knowledge? Brace yourself like a man because I will question you and you shall answer me. Where were you when I laid the earth's foundation? Tell me if you understand. Who marked off its dimensions? Surely you know. Who stretched a measuring line across it? And on what were its footings set? Or who laid its cornerstone? While the morning stars sang together and all the angels shouted for joy. The point is, in this, is you need to be real careful when we question God. Amen. Or what God has for us in our lives. Because as he points out there in, uh, in Job, that... He already knows everything. He had the power. He put the stars in the heavens. The angels shouted for joy. 
So we have to be careful when we question God because we may not like the answer he gives us. Because he's speaking to us in the storm. After the resurrection, Jesus spoke to the disciples in Acts 1, 7 through 8, if you take taken notes. He said to them, it's not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. You see, what Jesus was saying to the disciples here is, you guys are the church. He's telling the disciples, you're the church. Right now, our church is in a storm. A lot of churches are going through storms right now. You see, being a Christian is not only about good feelings. It's also about being strong in the hard times and being witnesses to the world. Monty says that all the time. When you accept Christ as your Lord and Savior, Satan's mad. Amen. Satan's mad because he's not worried about what's already his. He's worried about what he can steal. So, Monty tells us all the time that when you accept Christ, your Lord and Savior, that's when the storms come. Here's the sad part, though, is a lot of the storms that our churches today go through are internal. In other words, it's our own fault. Today, the enemy will try to distract us by strife, petty arguments, differences when we need each other the most. Bob Pierce, some of you heard of Bob Pierce, he was the founder of World Vision International. He said, let my heart be broken over the things which break the heart of God. Buildings and chairs do not break God's heart. People break God's heart. Monty was telling me a story about a, a church that uh, they changed the carpet in the sanctuary hall and people got mad and argued about it because they didn't like the color. In case some of y'all haven't noticed, we got new carpet. We got new chairs. We're doing fancy things on the wall, uh, which I really like the diamond plate. That's pretty cool, y'all. But the point is, these things have nothing to do with it. It doesn't matter what color the chairs are. It doesn't matter what color the carpet is. I mean, why argue over something so stupid as what color the carpet is? You don't live here. You know? My wife comes to me one day. She said, honey, do you mind if I remodel our bathroom? Now, I'm a guy, you know. I'm like, we still going to have a toilet in there? Yeah, yeah. Is the shower going to still be? Yeah. Well, then I don't care. I don't care what color the carpet or the tile or whatever is, as long as the bathroom still works. We shouldn't care what color the carpet or the chairs or the walls are in this building. What should matter is, are we working? Amen. Not what colors are in the building. Total waste of time. But it happens. People have left churches because they didn't like what color they changed the carpet to. It's a true story. You can't make that up. People, people do that. I'm telling you, if you left a church because you didn't like the color of carpet, you were here for the wrong reason. The wrong reason. Now, don't get me wrong. I don't miss the tile we had. And I do kind of like the carpet. I mean, I probably wouldn't put it in my living room, but it looks great in here. It did a good job covering the ugly floor, but that doesn't matter. You know, we got this church building old. It's a couple of army barracks is put together. So it's not a new building. And it still has its faults. But I've seen lives change in this old building. Hearts touched. People baptized. We had two baptisms last week. And it had nothing to do with the carpet. The reason I bring this up is because it shouldn't matter. Churches today get distracted by stupid internal issues like that all the time and miss the big point. Because you see, when we're persecuting each other over something stupid, what we're really doing is persecuting Jesus. Amen. I'm going to ask an interesting question. 
Why didn't the Jews like Christians? We've been watching uh, The Chosen lately. It's on, on Pure Flix, and it's the story of Jesus and the disciples and how they came about. And uh, <clears throat> they weren't real popular with the Jewish church. But here's the reason. The Jews didn't like the Christians because they were looking for a political savior, not a spiritual one. See, it seems kind of odd because you have the, the Jewish religious leaders and they're all about, are we following the law? Are we following the law? Are we following the law? And then when they're looking at the texts, shortly before and right after Jesus arrives on scene, they're interpreting the scriptures as someone's going to come save us from the Romans. The text they're using from the Old Testament, they're applying in the New Testament, the Savior is going to come save us from the Romans. I mean, how short-sighted is that for the Jewish leaders to think that the Messiah was come to earth to save them from another group of people? They're looking for politics. We look in the Old Testament, we're studying the Old Testament Bible study, and we're talking about God brings his people out of Egypt across the desert. They follow a, a pillar of fire at night, pillar of smoke in the daytime. God parts the Red Sea, brings water out of a rock, so as people have something to drink. Manna falls from heaven, so these people are eating in the middle of a desert. And what do they do when they get where they're going? They want to know if they can have a king. They feel like they just need to have a king like everybody else does. Now, it's pretty obvious they can look around and tell that all these other groups of people that had kings didn't have a king parked the Red Sea or feed them in the middle of a desert, but they wanted a king. So God said, fine, if that's what you want, here you go. And that's how we ended up with Saul. They were looking in the wrong place. You see, even today, there is no political party in this world that can bring salvation. Not a single one. Democrat, Republican, Socialist, Communist, it don't matter what country we're talking about from Cuba to Russia to America. None of those political parties are going to bring us salvation. You see, politics is important. It is, although the Bible says that God places rulers over us and we have to be obedient. But we got to remember, as much as it is important to vote your Christian values, we have to make sure the church doesn't get distracted by politics because politics aren't saving souls. They're not. Sometimes you need to let the church be the church. Now, storms have a tendency to cause us to withdraw, sometimes reduce our efforts. You know, you get in a storm like, oh, poor me, and then you stop doing stuff. But we can't afford to relax. We can't afford to sit back. In our comfort and then in our struggle, have we forgotten the primary mission of the church, and that's to bring people to Christ? You see, in the end, it won't matter who the president is, who your congressman is. You ask yourself why? It's because nothing's going to change this nation more than salvation of souls. Amen. If God's people win, then everybody wins. But we can't afford to be preoccupied with the things that uh, don't bring people to Christ. We can't relax even in the storm. We have to intensify our efforts in the storm. You can start where you are. Start in your own church. You know, we, uh, we went to Florida, and we ran across this little Baptist pastor, and he's got this booth at this flea market, this market day's market, and we're standing there talking to him. And while we were talking to him, he had some workers with him, and we watched a whole family get saved for Christ. A whole family right there on the spot. And I asked the, the 
Baptist pastor. I said, uh, Baptist church know y'all doing this out here? He said, yeah. Yeah, we're doing a good thing out here. So Dean and I thought it was amazing. So we come back and tell Monty, hey, Monty, we got this idea. We saw this pastor in church, and maybe we could do this, this market days ministry. And Monty says, well, if you think that's what you need to do, go for it. What, what do you mean? Go, go for it. If you think that's what God's leading you, go for it. Like Jack with Cuts for Christ. You know, Monty, I got this idea. And, well, if you think it's a good idea, go for it. So many churches today, you, you got this great idea for this ministry. And, well, we'll get with the deacons. We'll talk about it. We'll, maybe we'll put a committee together and see what we can decide. It. Now, Monty says, hey, that's what you feel God wants you to do. Go for it. Why? Because you have to start somewhere. You have to start somewhere. If not you, then who? How about that one? If not you, you, then who? Now, when you don't feel like going to church because you're in the middle of a storm, anybody ever feel that way? Don't feel like going to church. They're going through a storm. They're depressed. They're tired. They're sick. Something's going on. That's when you're supposed to go. When you're in the midst of a storm and you're struggling in life, don't go to church less. Go more. Be there anytime the door is open. If the door's not open, you're struggling, call another church member and talk. <clears throat> Don't shut yourself down because that's when you need people the most. Monty says, it's okay to not want to go to church. It's just not okay to not go. Now, here's a big one for you, though. If we want people to come to church, we better be saying good things about it. I've been to churches where church members were out there. Oh, I can't believe pastor said that. I can't believe they picked that carpet. We should have picked a blue carpet. You're losing your own case. You're losing your own case. If you don't love the church you're going to, you don't love this church, leave. But please, please find another church that preaches the gospel. That's why there's churches up the road. That's why there are cowboy churches. That's why there are biker churches. If you don't feel you're led to be at a church, don't stay. Be sure you pray long and hard about it because I've made the mistake of leaving a church I wasn't supposed to leave. Because I wasn't listening to God. I was being prideful. Love your church, come to your church, listen to your pastors, and then tell other people how amazing it is. That's how other people come. I understand that it's easy to get tired during storms in life. It's easy to get depressed and down about it. Vince Lombardi said, fatigue makes cowards of us all. That really don't require any explanation there so i'll just leave that hanging there fatigue makes cowards of us all go out in the world reach people make disciples for christ you can't reach people in these chairs here if they're not sitting there now you can sit around and hope somebody accidentally shows up Maybe they will or maybe they won't. So maybe you should go out and find people. Share Jesus with other people. <clears throat> there was this church one time. And uh, things were booming. Man, they had this outreach ministry. They were going door to door. They were talking to folks. And the church filled up. I mean, there were people everywhere. They had people standing in the back. And the deacon came to the pastor and said, Pastor, we we got to quit inviting folks to church. Well, we need to take that sign down out front. We ain't got room for nobody. We, we need to take that sign down and quit going out there. And the pastor said, no problem, no problem. Here's what I want you to do. Go out on our sign in front of the church. 
<clears throat> and put new letters on it, <clears throat> and it's going to say, I'm sorry we're full. Everyone else will just have to go to hell. <clears throat> hell, we're full. I guess we should stop. <laughs> really? I know that sounds harsh, but really, that's what you're doing. Well, we're full. I guess everybody's just out to go to hell. We can't, we can't reach nobody else. We'll find room. Okay, we added more chairs here. We'll find room. But we're not going to reach people for Christ sitting in this room every Sunday looking at each other. Start with your neighbor or a co-worker, friends, family. <clears throat> I know it's tough sometimes with co-workers. Those of us, I'm looking at Sprocket back there. That Some of us have government jobs, state jobs. And you kind of got to be careful because, you know, you could lose your job if you, you get too carried away with it. I mean, it's not like we're going to sit in prison like Paul did, but, um, you know, we got to be careful what we do. I mean, I've got a Bible verse on my county email. No one said a word. And I've been there for 13 years. <clears throat> and if somebody says something, I'll just deal with it then. Anyway, you got to be sensitive to people, though, when we're out preaching and sharing the gospel. I want you to think about this. Maybe ask questions like, how you doing? How's your life going? Anything going on? Anything I can pray for you about, talk to you about? Because pushy people run people off. Here's something to think about. The statements against sin in Scripture, they're mostly directed at the members of the church, not the world. I know that hurts to think about it that way. <clears throat> I'm not telling people to go out and thump people in the head with a Bible. <clears throat> a guy I ran into at a Walmart parking lot screaming at people with a bullhorn. He shoved his head in the window of my car and I shoved a gun in his face. I wasn't really following Jesus then, but you just don't go around sticking your head in people's cars. I'm just saying. Not a good idea, especially when you live in the great state of Texas. However, when you start your conversation with, if you don't repent from your sins, you're going to burn in hell. You're going to burn in a fire of hell. Probably not a smooth lean in. Not just not really a good conversation lead in. And remember, especially if it's your neighbor, because now you got to live next to this guy, you know? So we need to talk to people out of love. We should all be meeting and ministering to somebody. We should all be meeting with someone outside the church. Dean and I were eating at a Mexican restaurant one night, and there was a guy in a booth behind us. Turns out he was my doctor. And he's having dinner and he's preaching the gospel with this guy. The guy got saved in a booth at a Mexican restaurant. <laughs> Think about it. He wasn't sitting here at the church on Sunday in a chair in a pew. He got saved in a Mexican restaurant. <clears throat> I watched a girl get saved in a bar. But we can't do this hiding in the hole or hiding in the four walls of this church. It's not going to work. Saul, who was the greatest persecutor of the church in the New Testament, he became the greatest voice the church had ever had because God was speaking to him through his storm. It may be in the storm that the truth and the voice of God comes in the loudest. Even Jesus spoke in the storm. In Mark 4, 37 through 40, it says a furious squall came up and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern sleeping on a cushion. He was sleeping. The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? So what's Jesus do? He gets up. He rebukes the wind, tells the waves, quiet, be still. 
The wind died down and it was completely calm. Then he said to his disciples, Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? That was a pretty honest question considering all the miracles that they'd seen him perform. <clears throat> you know, obviously if Jesus was asleep in the front of the boat, he wasn't concerned, was he? They were. You see, sometimes we want to jump ship in the middle of the storm. But Jesus says, peace be still. When the storm rages, you're going through difficulties in your life. When you think things will never be the same again. Take heart. Because God may be using that storm to speak to you. He may be using that storm as a testimony. Like he did with Job. I don't know, just about anybody else in history got a better testimony than what Job came out of. <clears throat> but it was rough. When the storm rages across the water, let's be brave. Let's hold in on, on to our faith. And let's go to the other side of that ocean, that lake, that pond with Jesus. Isaiah 43, 2 says, When you go through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they will not go over you. When you go through the fire, you will not be burned. And the flame will have no power over you. No matter how rough the storm we're going through in life, no matter how tough things get, he will never leave or forsake us. Even in the COVID, he will never forsake us. <clears throat> so stand strong and praise him in the storm. We used uh, 18 days of COVID quarantine to have Bible study every night. And to read from Proverbs. I heard somebody was talking about how COVID has <clears throat> destroyed the churches. If you're praising him in the storm, COVID didn't destroy the churches. It started a church in every single home. Maybe this is the storm right now telling us how we need to be strong and how we need to be stronger and come closer to him during that difficult time. <clears throat> For us to continue to praise him in the storm because he'll see us out the other side. <clears throat> We'll go ahead and close in prayer. Lord, we've allowed our comfort to silence your voice, Lord. Now we face a storm today. Lord, we pray that your voice would be loud and clear for us and for the souls of lost men, women, boys, girls, straights, gays, Democrats, Republicans, blacks, whites, Jews, and Gentiles. Lord, to the entire world, we pray, Lord, that you help them come to Christ, Lord. Lord, let the kingdom, your kingdom, be the kingdom of our hearts and lives. Lord, may we not forget why we're here. Lord, help us to praise you in the storm, Lord. And Lord, please just lead us in your ways, Lord, so that we can be better Christians for you, Lord. And reach many souls for the lost. In your son's precious holy name. Amen.